for coming to another one of Stemming Wild Black's great events. Um, today, we are going to delve in a little bit more specific into some of our topics that we have been covering for the past few months. And it's really important for us to especially talk about things in a more finer way and specifically focus on the smaller things that create the biggest issues, right? So today, I want to make sure I first introduce myself again. If you don't know me already, I am Dr. Latasia Jones, a neuroscientist, ethics fellow at the American Society for Microbiology, and I'm also a STEM consultant, as well as a servicer for the community and the creator of STEMing Wild Black and a few other initiatives. I have an amazing, 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 amazing panel of women that are going to tell you some of the challenges that Black women in STEM face. And we're not only going to discuss those things, we're also going to look at your questions. We've looked at your questions during registration, which has built the conversation for today. So we're gonna cover how do you advocate for yourself in these arenas? How do you speak up for yourself as a Black woman? How do you deal with those challenges in STEM? So that way we can hopefully encourage the future generations to still go through these, these situations, go through these programs, get to those careers that they want to get into, even though these challenges may still exist. To start off, I just want to bring us to a little reflection that I had while in the process of producing this particular session. I thought about my childhood and I thought about the childhood of a lot of the panelists and other women that are here today and girls that are growing up now and how there wasn't much visibility of African-American women as I grew up, especially not African-American women who owned PhDs or worked as scientists, engineers, technologists, or mathematicians. So I am proud to say that I am not only bringing you a panel of women that reflect all of those careers in all of those academic uh, departments and programs and specialties, but there's so many other people that have joined our directory where we've been looking for Blacks in STEM to sign up to showcase their talents and hopefully collaborate with them in the future. If you'd like to sign up, please look at all of our social media. We also have our email address. And my biggest announcement for today is, yeah, drum roll, please. <laughs> We have a website up. So if anybody knows our panelists, Latiqua Jones, my sister, who is on today, she has helped to create our website. It is linked under heydrtay.com. One of the tabs has Stimming Wild Black. You can go there and not only learn a little bit about the panelists, but you'll learn about the programs that are to come and you'll be able to keep in touch with anything that's gonna happen later on and, step and contact us for collaborations as well. So please check out heydrtay.com, that's H-E-Y-D-R-T-A-Y.com. I'll type that in the chat box later. But that is an amazing announcement because we're just growing and growing as time goes. So I just wanna make sure everybody is getting the announcements and we all know what's to come. Um, like I said, I was happy to have this conversation today because of the childhood me that needed a person that looks like me now to say, hey, these opportunities are available. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our host today. You may have already known her, but just in case you don't know this amazing woman, Miss Janae White is our host for today. She is not only the founder of Girls to Divas Mentoring Organization, which is an amazing organization that helps middle school, high school, and even younger girls within the Tallahassee community. And she's even branched out a lot further since it's going virtual because of the pandemic. But she not only provides career structure and exploration, she provides mentors, she provides help with school. I've served as a mentor, so not only did I help with my mentee to do homework, but I also worked out with her, I had conversations about boys with her, and so on. All these things that girls need when they're developing and growing up my mentee had the chance to see me graduate as the first African-American in my program to earn my PhD. So when I say Janae White is creating a great venture, a great opportunity for these young girls, she definitely is. And that's why I wanted to make sure she is my host for the Black Women in STEM edition. If you wanna reach out to her, please let her know. She also does a lot of consulting to get you in touch with community service and your community. So. Without me taking up any more time, like I always say, let me pass my virtual microphone to Ms. Janae. 
Thank you so much for that introduction. Listen, it's an honor and a privilege to be in this space with women in STEM, Black women in STEM. Listen, this is amazing. You all are in for quite the conversation, a necessary conversation. And as Dr. Jones was saying, this is necessary. Mentorship is so important. Our girls, our young girls need to know that there's someone that looks like them that are, has already gone where they are looking to go. They need mentorship, they need guidance. And also our doctors and our future doctors on this panel also need each other as mentor, for mentorships and guidance. So this is very necessary and we're so glad that you're here a part of this conversation. So let's get into it. We have an amazing panel. And I want you all to just introduce yourself with your name, title, and finish this statement. The greatest challenge Black women in STEM face is, and let's kick it off with Ms. Lorray. Laurie. So my name is Aisha Laurie. I'm the Senior Director for Programs and Scholarships at NACME. And I would say the greatest challenge uh, for women, for Black women in STEM is really overcoming the angry black woman stereotype. Thank you. And Dr. Joy Gamble. Hi, I'm Dr. Joy Anna Gamble George and I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I would say that the greatest challenge um, black women in STEM face is when people limit our abilities skills and talent to the stereotypes that they place on us because of the reproductive systems we have within our bodies and the color of our skin. Thank you. Dr. Chum. Um, hello everybody. My name is Dr. Danielle Chum. I am a translational science liaison and I think the greatest challenge black women face in STEM is feeling welcome at the table. Thank you. Dr. Gardner. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Jay Gardner. I am currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And I would say that one of the greatest uh, challenges that Black women in STEM face is maintaining perseverance. Ms. Jones. Hello, everyone. I am Latiqua Jones. I am a cyber threat analyst for the Department of Defense. And I would say the greatest challenge Black women in STEM face is being misunderstood due to the lack of diversity, as well as the lack of exposure that they have at young ages to correct that lack of diversity. Dr. Carroll. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Carroll. I am currently a postdoc fellow uh, in the neuroscience department at the University of Maryland. And I would say the greatest challenge that Black women in STEM face is being seen, heard, and respected compared to our non-Black counterparts. Ms. Huggins. Sorry, I was muted there. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shaquilla Huggins, and I'm a STEM educator. And I would have to say that the greatest challenge that Black women face in STEM, and which I actually think is all over the world, is what I like to call the pink tax. We don't make as much as our male counterparts, even though we almost do twice as much work. That was the pink tax? Yes, ma'am. All right. And Dr. Stevenson. Hello, everybody. I am Adrienne Stevenson. I'm an assistant dean in the graduate school at Florida State University. Um, and I would say the greatest challenge that Black women in STEM face is inclusion and access to leadership positions um, in STEM careers. All right. So as you all can see, it is a challenge being Black, one. It's a challenge being a woman, two. But it's, a su it's super challenging being a woman who's Black in STEM. So we have a lot to unpack. And I believe we should start with feeling welcomed as a Black woman in STEM. 
uh, Dr. Chum, can you speak more to what it's like being a Black woman in STEM and feeling welcome? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I recall so many situations where I would walk into a room and all heads would turn towards me because I would be the only Black person in the room and the only Black woman in the room. And there is something about that moment. There is like a, you take a five second pause where you see the reaction and then you shore yourself up and then you take a step into the room knowing that already people have made judgments about you. You can see it in their faces. You can see it in the change in the mood. And then you shore yourself up you walk in there and you, you, you make the conscious decision to bring your best to be at a high level in order to change these perceived notions of who you are and what you can do. And then by the end of your circuit in the room, you're at a energy level of zero and you're barely hanging on. And I don't know, I don't know if any of you can speak to it, but you do it so many times it still never gets easy. It still never gets shocking to walk in there and just be looked at. Like, what are you doing in this room? Um, what are you doing here? What do you think you can add to the room? And this constant having to prove myself over and over again, even after getting my doctorate. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> that, that's challenging that we have to have those emotions on us when we're just here to do our work. We're here to do what it is that we're passionate about. To walk in a room and have to be faced with those challenges has to be difficult. Uh, Dr. Carroll, can you speak to this any deeper? Um, honestly, the, there was one experience that really came to mind when I started thinking about this, um, this session. There was an instance where I was asked to speak um, to my PI regarding a project that I had. And for me, one thing that I find myself having to do, uh, regardless of race or gender, but I like to prepare as best as I can for a situation, a project, whatever it is. So in this situation, I thought, okay, let me prepare, you know, get my articles that support my argument for this conversation I'm about to have. So I get to the meeting with the PI and immediately I see a, another counterpart of mine there who wasn't supposed to be a part of this meeting. Um, coincidentally, this person was not my complexion, not my gender either. Um, so already for me, it was a bit of like a, huh, that's interesting. I didn't even know you'd be here. And, you know, we're having this meeting. I'm speaking my opinion on the project. That is my project you know, showing the article I have to support what it is that I think is best for this project. And, Immediately after I finished my presentation, the PI turns and asks the counterpart, well, what do you think? Do you agree with this? You know, it's not, the, it's not even my counterpart's project, but it's like, okay, well, I want to hear your input. Um, and it literally was until this counterpart said, well, I actually think that's a really good idea that Heather has, that the PI was on board. And unfortunately, that was not the first time that this happened in that lab. Um, and for me, I just found myself realizing that, you know, this will be unfortunately a norm in this space uh, at the time that I was in, that post-op. And I really had to like over-prepare myself and find myself trying to become an expert in like every project that I had, um, which you should definitely always try to do. You want to be your own expert for what you're working on. but. Definitely was discouraging uh, to see that um, that situation happen several times. Uh, Dr. Carroll, you mentioned that uh, the greatest challenge is being seen, heard, and understood. That's so many levels. Uh, how do you advocate for yourself in these situations? Um, honestly, that's a tricky one because Sometimes when you're working for someone who just doesn't care how hard you prepare, no matter how much evidence you're bringing, no matter how much, you know, backup you have, if they just don't respect you, sometimes that's just what it is. 
So I find myself, okay, if I'm in a situation where I'm doing the best that I can to prepare as best as I can and be this expert and you're still not respecting me, you're still not seeing me, you're still not hearing me. You know, in that instance, it took a long time. And when I say a long time, it was like me being fed up for about a year where I decided, okay, in this instance, I think it's best that I remove myself from this actual lab and go elsewhere. And fortunately, it worked out for me where I moved on to another lab where things were completely different. Um, but I would say you have to know for yourself what your limit is. And when you find yourself in that space, in that space, listen to your gut and move on if need be. Wow. Uh, I, I believe that it's, it's unfortunate that we have to remove ourselves from situations. Right. Uh, but that's the reality that we live in. But what's also good to know is that there's amazing women like yourselves who are uh, creating these different platforms for people, color, uh, for us to express ourselves and have that space where we can do what we do. Right. Uh, Thank you. So, Dr. Gardner, you talked about maintaining per perseverance just keeping it going while fight, facing all these battles, while facing just trying to be uh, seen, while facing trying to be heard, and while facing while trying to be understood, as Dr. Carroll said. How do you maintain, how do you persever persevere throughout all of those encounters? Yes, it's definitely a hard question um, and sometimes at least what I found to be useful for myself um, isn't always the easiest solution but I found having a supportive network is really the best thing to keep me going so any microaggression that I face for being a woman or for being black being able to turn to friends to talk about it to vent if I feel like I'm not being seen or heard for my science having other peers that I can go to and be like, hey, do you want to just talk about science with me? I have this idea, but I need to like talk, talk out loud a little bit more. So just kind of finding those people that you connect with. And sometimes they're the same gender as you. Sometimes they're the same race as you. Sometimes they're not. But just finding those people who will support you, will effectively be a ride or die for STEM, um, that's that's what's really helped me in maintaining that perseverance through all of this. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Ms. Jones, I know that you're one of the youngest on our panel, and I can only ima imagine the challenges that you face, but how do you keep it going? What, what are your tools in your pocket? So, again a hard question but because i'm still learning because i am so young but um i think one of the biggest things that i've had to learn is yes i do need a support system but also i just have to learn how to just just keep it's it's really hard it's really hard i actually just went to, through a similar situation to one of the ones just mentioned and I'm at a loss for how to make it out of this situation. And sometimes you just have to be able to say that. You have to be able to acknowledge the fact that, hey, I need to find a panel or a group of people to talk about this with. Maybe I can find answers while also going through the situation at hand because I'm still going through these situations on a regular basis. But I have, I was actually able to find someone that um, relates to me and is going through this STEM battle with me. And it's actually a Caucasian female, very intelligent woman. She's my mentor and she sees it from her angle. And she has some of some very difficult things that she goes through as well. And she mentors me in, in that. And she also understands and sees, because that's important. She sees the things that I go through and why she understands why which is also important as well so that having that type of communication open is super important can you speak a little more to why it's important for uh, someone of a different hue to understand and see you yes i can because again i've been in that 
I've been in a situation where I didn't think I had anybody on my side in my last office. And I actually did. There was other women of other um, race races that were helping me behind closed doors. They were filing complaints on my behalf. And I feel like that's super important. They were having those tough conversations with their friends who would say just things that were, I, I don't want to say racist because I, I don't want to use that word, but I will say they were feeding on stereotypes that a woman that looks like me or, you know, act, speaks the way that I speak can never be, you know, doing the things that she's doing. So these women behind closed doors were confronting these guys and I had no idea. And then I would sit, they would sit there and pull me to the side and say, Hey, just so you know, X, Y, Z. That's so important because you're not a part, we're not a part of every conversation. Some of those conversations that are had, they happen behind closed doors. And the only thing we get is that weird feeling when we walk in the room, like it has been talked about earlier, like that weird feeling is because sometimes is because there's conversations occurring that you're not privy to. So it's definitely important to have people involved in those conversations that they would never, you know, say in front of you. Ladies, feel free to jump in if you have a comment to make. Uh, Ms. Jones, you spoke about the lack of diversity um, in STEM. And I'm curious to know how, how is it, how does it affect you as a woman of, in STEM? How does it affect you seeing that it's not a, di in a diverse environment? Excuse me. To be honest, maybe I'm a different breed, but it's motivating me. Like it's really motivating me to try to get up higher and higher and higher. I'm young for my age to be at the position that I'm at. And I, I acknowledge that. And I'm gonna keep trying to be the youngest at that in that position. The only black woman in the room, sometimes the only woman in the room. I've been that a lot. So I just it just keeps motivating me to do that. Like that that's 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 my counter is that I it does motivate me. Yes. Okay. So Miss Laurie, Miss Laurie, you spoke about overcoming the angry black woman uh, syndrome. Being a black woman, we're expressive, we're colorful, we're bright, we're bold, we're beautiful. But sometimes all that boldness comes off as anger. How do you overcome this syndrome? So I think um, just really showing up as myself. And I think um, it was said already um, that that is not something easy to do. It does take time. It takes different experiences. It takes advice. It takes a therapist. Like, it takes a lot. And, you know, just thinking about that whole angry black woman stereotype, you know, it really just, it's, it's been around for a long time. You know, like the origin supposedly is like from like the old Amos and Andy um, skits that they had in the 50s where they depicted black women as just being really sassy and domineering and it still persists to this day. And so every time I walk in the room, it's like I'm already being judged as being that before I even open my mouth and even say anything sometimes, which is really, really frustrating. So I think that, you know, that it's a huge problem. And I think the reason why this stereotype really continues to exist is because the lack of awareness of others that this is a stereotype and that it still does exist. And I think um, as well as the lack of just like understanding regarding black women's experiences. You know, I think, you know, many times when you come into spaces where you don't see people who look like you, who are your, you know, uh, your skin color or your gender, you're already, again, just having things put upon you before you even do anything. So I think that if there's more understanding in terms of the experiences that we have, which means that other people will need to put themselves in our position. I mean, you cannot fully understand and get it. But I think if you even try, um, other people even try to understand 
and feel like, you know, what it takes. Because it's not only just the stereotype of the angry black woman, but it's also like people don't even think about, again, like the mental effect that it has on you. It's, it's hard when you have to really carry all that around and it can be very draining. Um, and so it's really important, you know, when I come into spaces more so now than before, because, you know, like I said, I've understood it and grown and are continuing to grow within this space, but just to really be myself. And if that means that I have to call somebody out, then I will do that now. You know, if Jim just said the same thing that I said many times before, I wouldn't say anything. And I may say something later and talk to my husband and say, you know, Jim said the same thing I said in the meeting. But now I'll be like, so what Jim just said is what I said. And I don't have a problem with doing that. Um, and so I know that everyone has to get to a point in, in their own time and space. But I think that if we don't start making other people accountable, then they will continue to think it's acceptable, you know, to continue to treat black women in this way. And so that's how I deal with it. That's it. That's it. Accountable. You said, you said it. Uh, we have to hold others accountable for their actions on how their actions are reflected on us and how we feel about it. And that is not okay. Uh, I really want us to dive into what it feels like to be a part of this inclusive group of just Black women and how can Black women continue to help other Black women in this field when it comes to just being a support system. So Dr. Jones created this panel for us. How else can Black support Blacks in this way. And this is open to anyone. So can I, I guess I'll start it off. I did not put myself as a panelist, but I do wanna um, kind of just give a little insight as to some of the things that I reflected on when building this particular topic, uh, specifically when looking at the questions submitted by the registrants, uh, some of which are here today. And a lot of them was based on where are the Black women in STEM? And we're, we're, we're telling you these are the challenges that we face as Black women in STEM. And we're telling you these are the ways that you can defeat these challenges, get past them, and you know, use that for later on it's situations. But a lot of times, there's situations that people don't feel strong enough to get through, through those things. And they feel defeated. And it tells them, hey, I don't want to even try to get past that challenge. I don't see myself getting past that challenge. And that's where that lack of representation, that's where the issue is coming from. All of these challenges are building up and some people, they don't feel like they're able to get past that. And that's where inclusivity or having that village around you of individuals that will reinforce those things and tell you, hey, you're gonna make it through. I know you feel like you're the only one, come vent to me. Let's talk about, about them together. Let's build you up while you vent on it and then you can go back in there feeling stronger even though you're the only one there to fight for yourself. Uh, it's very unfortunate that it still occurs a lot of times, but this is one avenue in order to, you know, encourage those individuals to be stronger and be able to defeat those challenges as they come. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So I wanted to add kind of a mix between this topic and the last topic um, about Black women and being the angry black woman syndrome and how blacks can support blacks. I've been in rooms where other black men have kind of tried to overpower me for expressing how I felt or it's like, they're literally will just be like, I'm just telling you how I feel, I'm not, I don't know why you think I have an attitude, but I don't. I'm just trying to tell you how I feel. And then they'll put their big boy pants on, try to get all overly masculine and just be like, so are you saying you're not going to do this? Or are you saying you're going to do this even though I said this? And I'm like, whoa, pipe down. Why are you so aggressive right now? You're thinking I'm aggressive and you're the one being aggressive. So I guess what I'm saying is I think it's very important that other black men and women also remove their own stereotypes 
against us. It's like, you know, you should probably get to know me before you judge me based off of what you think every Black woman does. I'm, I'm talking to you right now. I might be a little bit passionate about what I'm saying to you, but I'm, I don't have an attitude. I'm not angry. I'm just trying to get you to see my point of view. But you overpowering me like that, you trying to put me in my place, now I'm going to have an attitude because you're not about to just walk over top of me like that, like I'm some three-year-old child. So I think it's really important that when it comes to Blacks supporting Blacks, that we don't apply the same biases to each other that we're trying to get our counterparts to remove from us, if, if that makes sense. Perfect sense. Anybody else want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I would like to jump on that. I think um, what I've noticed is that unfortunately some Black people get used to being the token Black person in a room and or in a space and feel threatened when other Black people are introduced to the same space. And that is a problem because you shouldn't like that. <laughs> you shouldn't like being the only Black person in a room or in a space. And I think that mindset of trying to make sure that other Black people don't come into the room so that you are elevated to the pedestal of being the, the, the token minority is a, is a problem and is a mentality that we have to change. And I think what we need to, all, all of us as Black people need to understand is that there will be situations where there will be one seat at the table that might be available. And if that is the case and there's two of us, we shouldn't fight over that seat. Let's, let's go build our own table. Let's just do that. Instead of fighting over the seat and fighting amongst ourselves, it's not, it's not productive. And I think that um, that's something that we definitely need to do. And also, tapping into networks that are around. Um, as Dr. Gardner said, being intentional about who you surround yourself with, having a, 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 a group of people who want your success, especially as Black people, we should want our success. We should advocate for our success. We should make sure that if they can stand on our shoulders, put yourself there and let someone stand on your shoulder to make it up to the top. I just want to pivot off of that just a, just a little bit. So I've seen the same thing with women against women in the workplace. I've seen the same thing with Black men against Black women in the workplace. I feel like if the same thing that you just said, if we just come to the same table and create our own table, there will be no need for there to only be one woman that can do this. Oh, we'll add this woman to the special project or we'll add this one to the special project. No, like we can both be in the same room at the same time. We don't have to fight over these scraps. There's room at, at the table. If there's room for all of these other people that don't look like us, there's definitely room for us at the, both of us at the table. So I definitely agree with what you just said. I think one thing we have to remember since we're all in STEM is also the competition within publishing or finding that innovative thing that you're going to patent or just getting those research findings before anybody else does. Just trying to make sure it's, um, we, we specifically focus back in on that just a little bit because that's for graduate students and the, you know, those individuals who are starting off or in their earlier phases are currently going through and they have this development process in which you have to learn how to get you know that data and everything out on a timely basis so you can publish on time because of the publisher parish situation right uh, especially if you're going towards academia and that's the unfortunate thing we've been trained to be competitive mm -hmm. but we were not trained to say hey you we can sit at this table together or hey let's make our own table so we could all be at so I get what all of you are saying but I think a lot of times the issue that people have is separating the be competitive portion or still being competitive and not compromising yourself as a woman trying to build, you know, when it comes to other women or when it comes to black people within this uh, arena as well. 
And that's the unfortunate thing. People usually choose. They pick and choose. I'm going to be competitive and I'm going to make it in this career or I'm going to be the person that builds or pulls somebody up as I go. And that's the unfortunate thing. Right, Dr. Jones. Uh, when I heard token, it made me think of that's just their way to survive. That's, that's what they know to do to survive as the only Black. Uh, not saying that it's correct, uh, but that's just their way to, of surviving in that space. Whew, a lot has been said on that topic. Let's switch gears a little bit. And let's talk about access to leadership. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, when it comes to access to leadership, uh, could you talk more about the lack of leadership and how do we overcome that? So I think it includes a little bit about, um, or a little bit of what everybody has said, right? So um, the fact that there are not enough seats at the table, um, and sometimes that's intentional. Um, the competitive nature of what we have to deal with to uh, just exist in this space. Um, but if you look at the positions that all of us are in, most of the time, the leadership that posi uh, leadership positions that exist in those spaces, we're not in right? So in order for us to climb and to lift while we climb, we have to be in spaces where we can generate positions for the rest of us to exist so that we can continue to bring each other along. Um, and it's, it's really, really hard. I'm going to say that there is no magic bullet for any of the things that we're talking about today. And it goes back to what Latiqua said in the beginning was, it's just hard right? Some of it you can process, some of it you can internalize, and other times you just don't have an answer. But I will say that I think we all can recognize that we don't exist in many of the leadership roles that we need to be in in order for us to make change, right? Those administrative positions, those executive positions, and in order for us to do that, more of us need to be in those spaces to create more spaces for us to be in. So it's just, sometimes it's really confusing because the more we advance in these spaces, the more challenging it gets, right? I think oftentimes we think the higher I get in these positions, I have more answers. No, <laughs> I think it's harder to sleep at night. It's harder to process. Um, it's harder to internalize because the more you advance, the more you see things that at other levels you were sheltered from, right? So um, it's, it's a wonderful thing, like, and I'm going back to what Latiqua said, she's motivated to move up in these positions, but it's a scary thing to move up in these positions. And the more you advance in these positions and you see what, you know, what things really look like um, uh, at the top, then um, it does motivate you to, to create more space for the rest of us to be in those positions. I have a lot more that I can say about inclusion and access because I deal with it every day. Um, but I'd love to hear um, what everybody else has to say because again, it's confusing. While you, while you have a, no a lot of knowledge, it's also a, a opposite ends of the spectrum with how you feel about how you navigate um, being in those leadership positions. I just wanted to provide an example of what she's talking about right now. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Um, I have now been privy to hiring processes and things like that. While I'm not a part of the actual hiring, I've been kind of letting the door just a tad bit to see things that are a, a tad bit discriminatory or I can see the good old boy system occurring you know i can see certain things that a lot of other people can't see at the lower levels or you don't think will ever happen you know how they say something you can have two resumes they look identical but yet one was let in the door and you're just trying to figure out how how that even happened i see those things now and i'm just like what it's mind-blowing so i definitely agree with what you're totally agree I think someone touched on it already, but I think we need to make sure there's more training 
um, for leadership skills. Um, because you could be the greatest researcher, but if you don't understand how to manage and run a lab, you won't have that position. So I think that there should be more opportunities you know, where this leadership um, training is provided to Black women. And then for those women who are there, and they don't even have to be Black women. If you have a champion in your area, I definitely say utilize that champion and get everything you can out of that champion. Because some of my greatest champions have not looked like me. And I think Latifah said that um, as well. So where you find your allies, you know, in those rooms when you leave or before you get there and those conversations are going on, your champion should be in there and they can advocate or bring information back to you. So you definitely want to make sure you create those allies. And then if you're in the position to create leadership opportunities, make sure that you're doing that. Um, because I think as, you know, Danielle said, you know, for some people, it's like, because you've been the only one for so long, sometimes you can get comfortable. I've seen, you know, other Black folks get real comfortable because they're being treated like royalty because they're the only one. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't want to share this spotlight because I'm getting all the shine. And because you've done it for so long, you just get used to it. And I think that that, you know, we, some of us, we have to kind of break out of that. I don't have a problem. I'm like, I'm trying to get everybody I can in here so that when there are things that I want to talk about that's affecting my community, then this, these are the people I want to have this conversation with and there are other people who are around who I can do that with. So I think, again, just making sure that there are leadership opportunities and, you know, and, and a lot of these spaces um, need to be created more. Definitely, definitely. Wow, that was powerful, y'all. So I, <laughs> I don't want to go back to the topic, but we, we, we kind of have to go back to it in order for us to just move forward with the right mindset as, as a whole. Uh, when it comes to Black women supporting each other and men being supportive of Black women, how can we help each other take away some of those biases? How, how can we decrease the judgment? How can we decrease that want to just be that person in the room, the only black person in the room? How, how can we kind of change this narrative? Um, I, 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 can, I can take a stab at that. I think it's about time that people recognize the black woman and want to protect her mm. there there is this intersection that black women are where we're seen as super strong so we don't need protection but then they forget that we're also human so we also need support and when it comes to prioritizing people always black women come to the bottom of the list um, like we're an afterthought like black, I saw a tweet recently that said black women will save the country. Why is it my job? Mm. You know, you, you go into graduate school and you become the representative for your entire race and your entire gender. So everything you do, your entire race and gender is judged by it. And I think that's not fair because you don't do that to other people. So I think that these expectations, these burdens you put on Black women to always show up, but you don't show up for them. So how about you start showing up for Black women? How about you start asking Black women, how can I be there to support you? How can I help you get better? How can I help you succeed? I think that is very important. And for us to be talking about this, hopefully that starts a conversation amongst people where they will be able to ask, how can I support you as a Black woman to succeed, especially in STEM where there are few and far between Black women in, in, STEM, in STEM spaces. And so I think it is very important for people to recognize that Black women are human. We feel, we, we, we can give strength, but we also need to be refilled sometimes. So um, ask us how we're doing. Um, ask us how you can help. 
um, and also make way so we can succeed. Don't get in my way and then ask me, oh, how can I help? You're in my way. <laughs> Move. <laughs> can I I want to piggyback off of that hold on let me turn my camera on so y'all can see my emotions because I oh my gosh I had to have this conversation with some of my closest friends not too long ago because I have one of my best friends who came up to me and made the statement I always know you're going to be okay no matter who's in your life, no matter where you go, you always find a way to make it happen. And while on one hand, I kind of was a little flattered, I was more disturbed than flattered because in my mind, what I heard was, I don't really check on you because I know you got it. And that bothers me. It bothers me so much. I seen, I seen a post on Instagram that said, let's start making much more space for women to be softer. And I just could not agree with that anymore because it's like, oh my gosh, do you realize that if black women had a choice, we wouldn't be, let me not, let me make sure I choose my words correctly. Cause I don't want you to think that we would just be these soft over one run humans. That's not what we're saying, but we're, we're, we're trying to tell people all the time, like, yeah, I'm going to be okay because I don't have any other choice. But if somebody gave me a choice in the matter, I would I would let you come in and take some of this burden off of me without a hesitation. But people get into these spaces where they just automatically assume that strong black women are 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 fine when you can't even imagine how many times I've I've been in my house crying in the dark by myself just overwhelmed and frustrated and feeling like I couldn't reach out and talk to anybody about it because they would just be shocked like oh my gosh you're crying yeah I cry <laughs> yeah I get frustrated yeah I'm upset so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's so important that <clears throat> people everybody in general stop giving black women this superwoman cape and expecting us to always wear it because there are so many times where i wish i could just take my cape off and just be naked in the sense because i hurt just as much as the next person but i can't show my hurt because then i'm being overly emotional or i'm being weak and i'm just trying to be human i'm just trying to be loved and i feel like black women would go to a higher level in almost everything that we do if we didn't have to fight so aggressively for it if we felt like we could be our natural loving soft feminine selves we would go so much further but we get so burnt out trying to always be strong that there are certain levels that we just emotionally and mentally can't even let our allow ourselves to get to so then our physical forms can't get there either so yeah danielle you hit the nail on the head with that i just had to kind of jump on that because i have been preaching that for like the last three or four weeks to so many of my friends and families like y'all stop looking at me as this overly strong person like yeah i got this i got that i fought for this i fought for that but you can't imagine the struggles I went to through to get here. And I'm not, I'm not allowing that energy in my space anymore. Like if you can't look at me and see the human that I am and the strong female that I am, that I, I don't even want your energy around me because I'm tired of having to fight. I'm not fighting anymore. I, I just want to jump in because I, I like to bring this up because this is something that I cried about recently. I, th I thank you for bringing that up, Shakira, because recently for me, I, I had the opportunity to mentor a young girl. Her mom reached out to me on Twitter and she said, would you please talk to my daughter? She wants to explore biomedical sciences careers. And for those who don't know, I graduated with my PhD in biomedical sciences, concentrating on a neuroscience dissertation. But during our conversation, this girl that I think she, she was, not even in college yet. I want to say she was in high school or something. She was in a STEM camp at the time. 
And she brought up a similar example that um, Latifu and Aisha brought up earlier, where she had this answer to this particular project and how to make it work. I think they were building battery circuits um, and, or the batteries from the potatoes or whatever. And we, there was a student in the class. Um, he asked her, why isn't his working? And she gave a phenomenal answer. She said, hey, let's increase the voltage by adding aluminum to the end so we can in increase the voltage automatically to our battery. And it was a correct answer. And I've done this, so I knew that. And she said, well, when she gave that answer to that boy, he turned around, asked somebody else, a Caucasian girl, and then got the same answer. And that's only when he actually implemented that answer in that solution. And she said, this is not the first time this has happened. She's the only African-American girl in her camp. So this has happened all the time. And it made me cry for her because she's not an adult dealing with these times where she's being overshadowed or somebody stepping on her and saying, hey, you're not good enough to have that answer. She is a girl. So think about how many years she's going to go through that weathering or that system in which, in which she's going to be basically looked at as somebody that's that mad black girl, it exists too. So these people are going to think of her as she's strong enough, she'll deal with it. And then she's going to, she's going to keep evolving, keep developing into that woman that has that exterior that sometimes doesn't match that interior. And that's the most unfortunate thing that I had to cry about recently when it comes to black women in STEM. It doesn't just start as in your womanhood. It starts earlier than that. And that's what I cry for, the girls, the boys, you know, the, the earlier stages, the youth. And I, I, I'd like to add to that, that when you, as you go up in higher ed, when it comes to, especially like if you go from college to graduate school and you're going to, in the professional world, you start to learn how to internalize a lot of feelings because if you express them, then you will be seen as overly emotional and not worthy of being on a project. You already disqualified. So already you're doubted for you, you know, you're a black woman already. There's doubt. Oh, why are you in this room for this? And then you have the audacity to not be strong. You have the audacity to respond when people come at you with mediocre quality work and you're just like, no, I, I refuse to accept that. Then you start being seen as difficult. So then you start molding yourself in order to succeed in a way that minimizes who you really are. And so then you get to a point where you lose yourself, but you can't even, how do you find yourself at that point? You, you've made it to the top, but at, at what cost? And I think there, is, there are a lot of us who are in therapy for that, um, trying not to get to the top um, and then look back and ask, well, where did I lose myself along the way? So I think that's where I, I feel like I always say it on here, therapy, if you can afford it, please get into it as soon as you can. So that as you're, as the, we're trying to change the world, but it's not changing at the pace we're changing ourselves. We're, we're at the pace we're trying to change ourselves. So until the world catches up, we have to protect ourselves. We are all we have. And there's only one of us. So if, you know, if you're empty, you can't give and you don't, you don't want to make it to the top and be empty because then what's the point, right? That's, that's really true. I, and I think as, as Black women, we, we need to be honest with ourselves and each other. Um, like it, it was mentioned, you know, just to be able to tell people like, I'm not having a good day today or I'm not gonna be able to take care of that. Because I think, you know, and for many of us, you know, we learned from, you know, our mothers, our guardians, whoever, maybe the women were in our families that I know my mother used to say, like, you never let nobody see you cry, right? You're supposed to be strong. And although, because we are black women, you know, we have many more challenges and double the challenges to face, I think it's also important important to teach girls like you will have those days and there are times that you have to tell and express and let people know that I'm not okay I'm not perfect um and I'm not wearing this cake today I'm just not <laughs> I don't feel like I'm not doing it <laughs> and to let people know that you know there are days that you are vulnerable you know when I talked to my mother and told her I was in therapy like 
for her generation, it was just totally different. It's like, what are you talking about? What's the problem? But now for my daughter, my daughter knows that I go to therapy and I tell her if there are times that you can't do something, just take a mental break and you can't do it. So I, I think it's, it's all in a way that now we're able to share that with girls. It's like you want to make sure that they understand they can do anything and that they are strong, but you also want to make sure that they understand that you can't do everything and you can ask for help and asking for help is okay. And I think that in these spaces and the communities that we have as Black women, we need, just need to have more of these conversations and to be more honest with each other. Like, girl, you're having a bad day too, but well, so am I. Not, yeah, everything is good at work. I'm doing great. I got promoted. Like, no, I almost lost it. I had to go in my office and cry and shut the door and get myself together and then go back into that meeting. And I think that we're not having enough of these type of honest conversations with each other. Agreed. There certainly needs to be more platforms like this where um, we can express ourselves and we can be transparent. Um, this is such a heavy topic uh, to understand that just last week, last month, uh, someone was so emotional about a situation just because we're Black, just because we're a woman, because we're in STEM. I would love to hear you all tell us how you cope. So I heard therapy, I heard mentorship. Was there anything else for those that are listening that are trying to deal um, that you can share as a way to cope? And this is for anyone. So I think I keep my heart and head healthy um, by serving. Um, that's one of the things that I enjoy doing. Um, and while it can be overwhelming um, and, and feels like I'm taking on a lot, to know that I'm pouring into other people and that that's going to help them to pour into the next person. Because my charge is always what I do for you, you do for the next person, right? So it's the gift that keeps on giving. And so <clears throat> in that way, for me, um, I keep my heart and my head healthy just by, by giving back, by serving, by helping other people to grow. Um, and just knowing that that's going to eventually come back to, to, to help me grow. So different things, mentorship, um, uh, therapy, all of the things that everybody mentioned, um, but also seeing other people advance and grow and, and serving in that capacity is a way that I, that I cope. And I cry and I scream and I vent mm -hmm. and those things too. So I'm not gonna pretend that I keep a cape on um, every day. Actually, sometimes I throw it in the trash can. I don't even wash it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so those things in addition to. Um, I, I'd like to add to Dr. Stevenson's uh, comments by saying that um, know how far your limits are and be okay telling people no. We, our instinctive response to anything is, yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. And then you open your calendar and it's chock full of meetings and obligations and there is only one hour in the day for you, and it's that hour where you take a shower. That's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. You need to be able to say no. We sometimes fear, we sometimes come from a place, a scarcity mindset where we feel like if we say no, then the opportunities will stop coming to us. But that's not how it works. You're phenomenal at what you do. You're the expert at what you do. So these opportunities will definitely come to you. And I feel Jay giving me a side eye because I should be saying no sometimes. <laughs> but I think that it, it takes a while to break this habit of ours, but it's okay to say no. It doesn't mean you're not good at what you're doing. It means that you recognize that at this moment, you can give your best to what they're asking you to do. And that is okay. So say, yeah. learn how to say no. Ease yourself into it, but learn how to do it. I would probably, I'd probably actually say uh, the opposite. So not actually coming for you, 
but since it does take a lot of time to get to that place, especially when you might feel like the first time someone emails you or the first time you're invited for a talk or whatever to get that internship, it almost feels like a I've made it kind of moment. And so you want to hold on to that. It's to have the friends that will give you the side eye or threaten to text you twice a week and say, have you done something for yourself? Which Danielle has done for me because I also do too much. And yeah, so, so basically having those friends, it kind of goes back to having that support system, right? Your, your writer dies with STEM that you can just message and say, I'm doing too much. How do I say no? And like, they'll help you draft an email. If like your brain is now fried and you can't come up with the words, they'll help provide those words for you so that you can like get things off of your place. So you can have time to heal. I'll jump in really quick, um, kind of a different direction, but I know folks mention in terms of coping, some people do therapy, um, you know, Adrian mentioned like mentorship, pouring into some others. Um, I found myself kind of having another outlet. Like, yes, we are in STEM, we're professionals, we're trying to reach whatever level of greatness in our profession, but it's like, we're so much more than just STEM. So I found myself being intentional of like, okay, I used to be a bookworm, you know, along the way, grad school, my, my books were obviously textbooks, but trying to make time to get back into my fiction or whatever other, you know, if it's exercise, something that just for me was like, let me completely disassociate from the work uh, and the stress that comes with it. So I think it's good to have that balance of, you know, what you love to do from a professional standpoint, but also personal, what do you love to do? Just keep that balance, it's very important. Anyone else want to jump in? This is your, I agree with um, what everyone is saying. Uh, for me, I always like to take a mental health day, so I will actually take time off from my job just to rest up and try to do the things that I really love doing. Um, I believe self-care and just taking care of yourself and loving yourself is very important because if you don't do that for yourself, you can't do that for anyone else. Um, and I do think sometimes when you're just really stressed out and tired, it really goes and can affect um, how you work on a job. Um, the other thing I do is that I love surrounding myself with inspirational, powerful women that are doing things that I want to do down the line. So I tried to create a a circle around me of women that I can go to for advice and that can really serve as an inspiration to keep me going. Um, and then the last thing I always go back to just focusing and looking back at my game plan. What do I'm trying to achieve at the end of the day? You know, sometimes that would be inspirational, just like planning out stuff or doing things and just meeting new people who are trying to do similar things. So that are some of the things I do to help um, just really relieve the stress and overcoming stuff. I just want to comment that if there are any graduate students on the call, the idea of taking a day off from your research sounds foreign. Um, it's, it, it almost sounds as if I'm asking you to commit a sin. And I'm not. Because you will, if you don't take a break from your work, you will burn out and start to resent your project, which would defeat the entire purpose of you going to graduate school. So if, you know, if you can get to the point where you can talk to your mentor, or your PI and say, listen, I am struggling. And that is, that also goes back to what we're talking about. We have to be comfortable admitting to weakness and saying, I'm struggling. I need to take Thursday, Friday off. Give me, give me, a, give me some time to myself. I will come back refreshed you will because you will you come back with new eyes you will come back with different ways of addressing your question and it's really hard because in grad school you're trying to get your data in time you're you're trying to not spend too many years of your of your life in graduate school but it's not you don't want to resent something that you end up putting so much into your so much of your life into so try very hard and walk into your mentor's office and say, 
I am struggling. I need a break. Give me a day off. That is not a public holiday. And then don't check your phone. <laughs> don't check your work email. If you can, just uninstall your work email <laughs> app from your phone for that day or for that weekend. And then as Dr. Carol was saying, you go read a book, go dance, go hike, something, something that is not STEM related because you are so much more than that. You are a facet of so many, you have so many facets um, and it's hard, but please do it. Um, your project will still be there and you will still make your graduation date, I promise. But if you're burnt out, you will not make your graduation date, then what's the point, right? The group chat is booming. Uh, just wanted to point out what someone said. Burnout is preventable. I thought that was that was key. Burnout is preventable. Uh, I do have a sort of follow up question towards Dr. Gardner's uh, point on this. So, how do you advocate for yourself when you're a new hire? You're black. You're a new hire, and you're being asked to do all of these things. And knowing that you're one of maybe the only black person in the room, knowing that you, you're in this position, how can you advocate for yourself beyond having homegirl hit you up and a homeboy hit you up and say, uh, you know, tell them X, Y, and Z, like you need your break, You've done, you're doing enough. How do you advocate for yourself in those avenues when you're at work? So something that worked really well for me when I started my postdoc, so I finished my PhD and then I moved to Philadelphia to join a new lab. Um, my PhD studied viruses, now I'm doing cancer biology, so com and not a cancer that's caused by a virus, so completely different things. And I think what helped me from the beginning was being very honest with my advisor about what all of my interests were from the start. So she knew coming in that, yes, I'm a scientist, this is not my background, I'm going to need help, but also that I draw and I make comics and that I enjoy teaching and I have all of these other passions and that I'm going to keep doing it. So there are other things at my institute. So I teach through, uh, I teach high school students how to do research through a program at my institute. I still make comics. My advisor, actually finds things and gives them to me just like a hey I saw this and thought of you and I think just from being that honest from the beginning and setting up our relationship to be that way she can be honest with me when it's a uh, Jay you're doing too much your research is starting to suffer or I can just be like you know that I'm gonna do this anyway and she'll go you're right so <laughs> so part of it is just you know building your relationships in a way that benefits you. Not to make that sound kind of manipulative, but just in terms of being honest with who you are, what you do, and letting them know that from ground zero, then they can never be surprised when you need to take off or you need to do another activity. I love that. Anyone want to follow up? Yeah, I just wanted to give an example of what Jay is um, speaking in reference to. So I started research my freshman year during an internship. And because the advisor that posted about that research became my advisor, I started in his lab, his lab immediately, actually during my undergrad years. So every summer, every year, I was working in a lab, my undergrad, and then it led to me doing it during my master's years. So we had a conversation very similar to what Jay brought up. You know, what do you plan on doing? What do you like to do? Are you ever going to take a break? Da -da 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 -da. Um, and he said, well, I have this timeshare or something. I think it was in um, Europe. And I said, well, no, my mom just found out that her family lineage is from Ghana. I would really like to go to Ghana. And it opened up a doorway for me to go to Ghana. And I taught math, science, and English in Ghana for about a month, month and a half. And if we had never had that conversation, that exchange between, you know, wanting to take a break, him understanding you have been here every day for years now, you can take a break. It's okay. Um, and him telling me that, it would have never opened up that doorway and that opportunity. I actually also had a scholarship to go with the school, so I didn't even have to pay for my room and board. I literally paid for my plane, 
and whatever money I brought, I bought probably the whole country and then <laughs> home with me. Um, <laughs> and you know, but it was, it was a great experience that I never would have had if we never had that conversation. And then that led to my PhD years where I went through a few traumatic situations where I literally sat down with my PI and I said, hey, I have to go home. I have to go home. These are the plans, X, Y, Z. And the tip that I will give you is if you feel uncomfortable with leaving in the time that you need to leave, come up with a plan that brings you back up to speed when you get back. So yes, I would like to go home from this time to this date to this date. But when I come back, I plan to do this by this date, this by this date, and this by this date. So that way it brings comfort to your PI as well. Hey, I get that you have this personal thing going on. Thank you for giving me this plan for when you come back, you'll be right on the same, you know, same pace of what you're doing when it comes to your research. And we can just kick off where you stopped at and it'll probably be a lot better because you'll be refreshed when you get back. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Any other comments? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that. These have been fantastic suggestions. Um, when you, I'm going to speak at it from like an industry perspective uh, for any, if there are any grad students who are thinking of going into industry. Um, when you're interviewing with a company, you will definitely start getting the kind of vibe where you will know what they are expecting from you from the first week. So ask questions that will address what you mean. Don't assume they know. Ask, ask a very blatant question. What are you expecting from me in three months? What do you expect from me in six months? Get it on paper if you can. And so that, so that when you come in, they don't pile on and you feel like you can't say no because you're the new person in the room and you have to do your best. Ask and say, this is, is this what you're expecting from me? How fast, how quickly do you expect me to pick up the technology, how quickly do you expect me to pick up the lingo? Ask these questions, ask about time off, ask about 401k matching, ask these questions. And if you don't know what the questions are, reach out to us, we can put together some for you. And also brainstorm with you to have questions that are unique to you to make sure that your transition into any role, whether it be a postdoc, whether it be a grad school lab, whether it be an industry role, is intentional and well suited for you because if you are uncomfortable in your environment you will not succeed and that's not what we want we want you to succeed so yeah awesome awesome okay ladies so i do have one last question before we address the questions in the chat and that's for miss huggins to answer and anyone else can jump in and that's about the pink tax uh us being paid what we're worth let's talk about it Go ahead, Ms. Huggins. Hey, prepare for this. Did a little research. <laughs> so I want to read you guys some statistics that I came across that was very interesting to me, okay? All right, so we're talking about the lowest wages, the lowest paying jobs in the U.S. and the highest paying jobs in the U.S. and how black women fall into percentages there okay so black women make up 10 percent of the low-wage workforce but then that's jobs that's typically pay 11 dollars an hour or less but while they make up 10 percent of the low-wage workforce they um hold on let me read, make sure i read this correctly they they only make up 6.2 percent of the overall workforce so for those of you that may not understand what that means Black women make up more, they, black women have more jobs in the workforces that pay 11% or lower than they have of all the jobs in the entire US. There's 10%, black women make up 10% of the low paying jobs while they only make up 6.2% of all jobs. Now, when it comes to the higher paying jobs, um, black women make up to only 2.7% of the higher paying jobs, jobs that pay um, $100,000 or more. Um, they also found that it would take a black woman, let me make sure I read the statistic correctly. The gap between black women and black men amounts to a loss of 21,000 a year, which means that black women have to work more than 19 months until the very last day in July to make as much as a white 
or non-Hispanic men did in their previous 12 month calendar. And um, I was, another statistic says that black women were paid just 80 cents for every dollar that they're, they're paid to their male counterparts. And this is a statistic from just four years ago. This is a statistic um, that was taken in 2016. Um, yeah, so just reading those statistics are very disheartening, right? It's, it's completely ridiculous that Black women are literally only make up 3% of the jobs that pay more than $100,000. That is completely outrageous because it's, it's, it's so many Black women out here that can do so much more than we're giving the opportunities to do. But because either we don't have access to those opportunities or somebody isn't um, giving us enough of an opportunity to show what we're capable of, so we never even make it to those opportunities. Or even piggybacking off of what we said earlier, we get this stereotype that we're so strong that we can just make it so nobody helps us get there so then we eventually get mentally or emotionally blocked from actually making it there and, and we only make up three percent of the population and that is just completely disheartening to me and i really hate that um and i so that's why i do everything in my power to every time I see a little black girl walking down the street. The first thing I do is I tell her how beautiful she is. I tell her how smart she is. And I say, you know, you can be anything that you want to be. Don't let anybody tell you anything different because that statistic has to change. It's ridiculous. And then another portion of that article that I was reading that um, we didn't touch on, but I think it's very important for us to touch on is their article was saying that a lot of the reasons why black women only make up 3% is because once when it comes to motherhood, we get into a place where we almost have to choose. It's like, okay, if I have a baby, am I gonna lose the opportunities that come for me? I don't know if, if anybody saw the show on who it was called uh, Pretty Little Liars. And in the movie, she was on her way, on her way up. She worked for a, um, a journal, a newspaper, and she was doing well. She was about to be whatever the top newspaper person is called in their company. And then she got pregnant. And when she went on her maternity leave, they gave her position away. And she was never able to climb back to that top spot again because obviously the company had to keep moving, but she had to take care of her baby. And I think... <laughs> it's okay. And I think that's something that we, you know, we didn't touch on in this in this um, conversation, but it's something that we definitely need to talk about how women, we get to a place where we almost have to choose between striving and going full force for our career or slowing down to fall in love and be moms and things like that. So yeah, I just wanted to give you guys some of those st statistics so you can see how big of a gap it is between First of all, it's a huge gap between black women and black men, yet alone the gap between black women and men, period. So, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing on this topic. Um, I feel like a lot of black women feel like they have to go between surviving and doing salary neg negotiations. Perhaps this is kind of going along with what she's saying. Um, I've had to tell people that I'm not I know I'm worth more than that. And then I've had to go get uh, somebody to write on a piece of paper that we're gonna hire her for the, give me my offer letter so I can go tell these people, cause I wanna work here and I'm not gonna not work here, but I need you to tell these people that you're gonna pay me this because if not, I might have to travel 30 more minutes and go to that place over there so that they can pay me what I'm worth. And I think that's very important when it comes to black women because I've worked my first job I, I don't regret it because it's a part of my experience, but they hired me and they paid me way less than they paid most of the people in my office, my first contracting job. So I made sure that my next one, that they paid me up in the top 20% in that office. And the way that I did that was going and getting that offer letter from other company that they don't, you know, their competitors and coming back to this company and saying, hey, you see this? It's not okay. 
There is not okay that you're trying to pay me $20,000 less than somebody, you know, Joe over here that has the same, probably less things on his resume, less experience on his resume than I have just because I don't know someone or whatever the case is. I definitely feel like the survival portion of that as well, that fear that, oh, if I don't accept it, then I won't have, be able to pay my bills. Or I won't be able to do this. I won't be able to do that. I feel like that is why we should just, when you go looking for jobs, um, those people that are in school right now, and you know, especially well, all, all of us, but in the tech world, leverage those offer letters. Because in the tech world, IT, cyber, they will give you offers if you have the right certificates, if you have the right internship experience, they will give you those offer letters. And what you need to do with those offer letters is leverage them. Hey, X company is gonna pay me this. So I need you to either match that or I can go to X. So, you know, back over there. So, yeah. And yeah, and speaking <laughs> on that, just to back her up because that was um something that i'm learning well i knew it i just was afraid to be honest don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth like don't get into a place where you're like all right they're offering 65 so i'm gonna just ask for 60. no ask them for 70 because you're worth it you're worth it especially if you have the credentials to back it up like come on man i have two master's degrees and i'm working on my doctorate not only not to mention i have so much technology background that there is so much that i can do and even if i cannot do it i guarantee you i'll learn it before by the time you need me to have it so i'm not going to sit here and let you lowball me and that is something that you, I guess you got to find that balance between coming off as the angry black woman and getting what you deserve. Like, don't allow people to, I guess, get you to be afraid of asking for what you deserve. Because here's what I've learned. If something doesn't work out for you, there's always a better opportunity somewhere else. If you're not going to get what you deserve at company A, okay, I'm good. Y'all can go hire somebody else because I'm gonna just go over here and wait for company B. Because if you continuously allow somebody to lowball you, you'll just continuously have to try and climb and climb and climb and climb and climb. And you'll never reach where you're supposed to be because you let one person do it to you. And please understand that all the other Joe, the men, they are applying for those jobs that they, they don't qualify for. And they are getting those jobs that they do not qualify for. And they are getting that salary that you should be getting. So if you ever feel like you cannot apply to this job because you don't have that one thing checked off the box, please understand that I work with people all the time that didn't have that box checked off, yet I had to have that box checked. No, apply anyways. And still do your salary negotiations anyway. It's, we have to become empowered like that. I've talked to so many women that allowed themselves to be put in that category of, oh, you know, I don't have a, a security plus cert certification or I don't have this, you know, I don't have my, my master's degree. I only have my bachelor's in computer science, so I can't be a software developer. I'm like, are you serious? Absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. Dr. Gamble George? Oh, I would like to, oh, yeah. I would like to, um, I agree, um, but I would like to also add, um, when it comes to, I guess, knowing your worth, I think sometimes we don't know how to negotiate for jobs. Um, Cause I know when I was getting job, different job positions, no one ever like gave me advice on, this is how I should go and negotiate. Um, I had to actually learn over time through experience. Um, so it's, sometimes it's good always to seek out advice from people to get that assistance. And, and then the other thing that I do is um, I try to be strategic about when applying for jobs, I always look at the national average 
And if I have something special to bring to the table, I always add more on top of the salary. And I also think about the benefits. Um, Because sometimes from the salary, they'll also take off money from your benefits. So I add even more money for benefits. So I try to do all of that when it comes to negotiating for a job. So definitely um, go out and seek advice from people because sometimes they can give you different pointers about how to negotiate. So I think sometimes we just don't know how to advocate for ourselves, even when we do know our worth and we know, you know, that we do have these certain qualifications that make us, you know, more qualified for this job than somebody else. Thank you, Dr. Gamble George. I think we also need to make sure that um, just going back to allies again, um, and the information that um, you presented in terms of the percentages of women and what they're paid, there are still people who have no clue that these differences even exist, uh, women as well as men. And so I think many times when we're able to have the statistics and the facts and the data as, you know, we're all um, women in STEM, people like to see these. And I think it's nothing wrong with making sure that they understand and they know, right? As early as talking about it with young children, right? So I, I have twins, so I have a boy and a girl. And I decided that for a whole month, I gave my son, they were doing the same exact chores. And I gave my son less money. They were doing the same exact thing, the same exact age. And I asked him how he felt about that. And he was like, this is not fair. I'm doing the same work as my sister and I'm getting less money. And I said, this is what happens to women all the time, every day. There are men who are getting paid more than mommy right now. And I'm doing the same exact thing as them. And so for him to be 13 years old, he could not even understand and fathom like how that was fair. So I think we need to really make sure that, you know, we educate our children and we also educate men, you know, about the fact that this exists. And there are women also who, who don't know about these statistics. They don't even understand and realize that they are getting paid to do the same thing. So it's, it's really about education um, and so I'm really happy that you brought up um, this information because um, I think the more we talk about it and we're educating um, other people about it, you know, maybe it, it'll change at some point. Thank you, Ms. Larry. And I do believe that it's changing because of these courageous conversations that we're having. So we have a few questions from, the, uh, from our guests. The first question is, what is your advice uh, to a 12, your 12 year old self or to a 12 year old gar girl who likes them but is afraid to try it? My this is, advice, um, doctor. Oh. go ahead, Dr. Gamble, cause you know, I don't wanna <laughs> overpower you, I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, so my advice, I think one of the regrets I had when I was much younger was that I was too scared to take risks. So I remember I missed out on the opportunity to go study abroad, and I still regret it from today. Um, so my advice to that girl would be to take risks because you never know where it might lead to. Um, it might lead to a great opportunity that down the line to an awesome job that you might want to do or some experience where you actually will begin to love or have a a uh, greater interest in STEM. Ms. Hagen? Okay, so my advice is, well, I'm just gonna give you my favorite saying. So my favorite saying says, always shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you'll land in the stars. And I have that written everywhere. I love it. That is my absolute favorite quote. I don't even know who said it. I could have just heard that on TV one day. I'm not sure. But at the end of the day, the saying is saying, you know what, why not? Because even if you miss your mark, there is a mark right below it that you're going to land on. And that gives you enough leverage to one day get to the mark that you're trying to get to. But if you, just like um, um, Jay said, Ms. Gardner said in the chat, she said, you miss 100% of the shots that you never take. So... Why not? Literally, when you get afraid, when you get afraid, literally stop in that second and say, why not? And if you can't give yourself a reason why not, then that is every reason you need to do it 
that's all the need, reason you need to do it because if you don't know why you can't do it, then that typically means that you can. Thank you. All right, we have another question. How do you separate being a mentor and being the face of diversity? It's like you want to be supportive in the, and the voice, but you don't want to be the posture child for how diverse or inclusive your program or institution is. I'll take that. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard. It's a hard balance to achieve because I, you know, when, you, for instance, I can talk about graduate school where I was called upon to be in almost every brochure, um, every picture to, at opportunity, every, um, I was asked to go and help recruit students from Abercamps conferences. Um, knowing for a fact that my program was not as diverse as they were portraying. And so one of the things that I would do is I would, I would gently, let's say at Abercamps, I would gently guide the questions the students were asking me to the point where they would blatantly ask me how many black people are in your program. And then I would be honest and say, well, there are three in the entire building, all five graduate programs. So know this and be aware that this is what you're coming into. But the three of us that are there are going to prop you up higher than you can ever imagine. So keep that in mind as you make your decision. It's really hard to not be a poster child, but the reason why we're poster children is because there isn't enough of us. So we have to populate it. And right now to populate it, we have to be the poster children. It's the unfortunate truth, in my humble opinion, and until the moment where it's not uncommon to see a black woman in STEM in a lab wearing a lab coat, until that moment comes, use me as a poster child. I will make sure I populate this area. If you give me the platform, <laughs> rest assured, I'm going to use it to populate with more people. So that's my two cents. I just want to piggyback off of Dr. Chung and kind of add on to my, my graduate experience, which is very similar. I was on the front of brochures and stuff as well. And um, I utilized, I kind of combined mentorship and being the face of diversity. So anytime they had an opportunity coming up where they wanted to talk about our graduate school program, I was there. Um, they wanted to, you know, ha hopefully they were looking for our volunteers to speak about the program. I was there. So not only were you going to talk about this program, but this black girl that was in the program was also going to share how she's getting all these scholarships and stuff because she's the only black there and you can do it too if you join the program. So I was providing encouragement and promoting for diversity while in the position of being the poster child. So you can't, you can't, I get it. There's this token black syndrome that a lot of people talk about a lot of times, and it is frightening to feel like you are that poster child, but use it to your advantage. Latasia was one, was one of the highest paid graduate students in her program at the time. Why? As the only black, you get the black scholarships, the black fellowships from the graduate school. So, and who am I competing with in my department? So, um, and on top of that, and that's, that's essentially how I met Dr. Stevenson who helped me to get a lot of those fellowships and those opportunities. And we kept going out and we were doing other things within the community to show you can be black and you can be in STEM and you can be a black woman in STEM. So we utilize, you know, that mentorship and the combination with that diversity subject or being the poster child or whatever else to get out there and tell people, hey, don't be afraid of this. You could do this too. Let's, let me show you how. I think I want to add to that really quickly because in addition to combining the mentorship with being the face of diversity, you can use that to hold people accountable. So the people that are asking you to be that face, this is an opportunity to sit down with those people and say, so what are you gonna do differently to make sure that the spaces that these black and brown faces are entering are welcoming, are supportive? How are you going to increase the number of fellowship opportunities or scholarships that they have so that they don't have financial problems when they come. So in addition to welcoming the opportunity to be that face of diversity, it's an opportunity to behind the scenes or up front 
advocate for things that you know are needed in those spaces and hold those people accountable. Because if you want to put me on a brochure, this is what I need you to do. If you want me to sit at the table and be the voice, this is what I want you to do. And so that's an opportunity for you to push the envelope on some of the things that are needed for that diversity to be supported in those spaces. So when you're using it to your advantage, make sure that you try to think of all the things that you can do to hold those same people that want you to be the face accountable for the things that are needed for support in those spaces. Do we have one more response before we go to the last question? That is so true. And, and I was gonna say the same thing, um, Dr. Stevenson, just making sure that people are held accountable. You know, um, just on the flip side of it, you know, as, as faculty, many times when other faculty are writing grants and you're the only one in that department, they will come to you to say, oh, can you provide a section or write a blurb in, you know, for diversity or broadening the participation, you know, of my grant. And so I would always say I have no problem with doing that, but there has to be something in it for me. So if you're going to write this section, I need to be a co-author. I need to be a co-PI on this grant. I need to make sure that if I'm going to write this, there are dedicated funds to the minority students who are in this department. Um, and so, you know, again, leveraging and utilizing and hold, holding them accountable to say, you have to put this information in your grant and I need to get something out of it. So that's, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, and they're going to call on you all the time. You don't have to say yes all the time, but if there's something that you can benefit from or you can help others benefit from, then just understanding how to utilize that to get something out of it. Thank you. So for our last question, uh, I would just like two women from our panel to answer. And the question is, how would you address someone that questions your identity as a black woman because you don't live up to how they might see black women portrayed in movies, social media, et cetera. For example, I am in an interracial marriage and people automatically question how black I am or my intentions due to his hue. Anyone want to take a stab at that? I, I can't answer at the moment how to address being in that situation, but I do want to say that I can commiserate with you and I completely understand that space. Um, I'm also in an interracial relationship. Thankfully, no one has said anything with that regards, but um, being having your identity questioned regardless of if it's being black being a woman whatever is part of the microaggressions that we will persistently face um, in our roles in our job I'm not saying that that makes it okay but that that sort of in part comes with that maintaining perseverance that i was talking about at the at the very beginning um, it might be my personal snark from my personality because when I heard that question, my initial response is, why is it any of your business who I love? And sometimes, I mean, sometimes I have no filter and that snark would be my answer. And then, you know, you kind of keep stepping and move on to the next thing because in all reality, who you love has absolutely nothing to do with your ability to perform your job. So for this scenario, while it sucks that someone is pressuring you and putting that hurt on you, they almost don't even deserve your response and your time because it has nothing to do with anything of what you were there to do. Thank you. I just want to add on that it's, it's actually very lazy on that person. I'm not trying to be rude and name call, but get to know me. That's essentially what you're lacking here, right? Like you didn't take the time to get to know me before you generalize me for the social media or for who you thought I should date or who you thought I should be, whether it was the girl in the movies, the girl on the reality show or whatever else. Get to know me so you can know that, hey, this is Dr. Latasia Jones and this is who she is in her entirety. And stop being lazy when it comes to me because I'm not gonna be lazy when it comes to you. So 
that would be my uh, response in reference to that person questioning your identity and that question that person questioning your relationship all together if they're questioning it and they're trying to stereotype you they're not for you so don't let them take up but so much space okay and you um go ahead i would like to add to that um so i think for me i always try to like pick my battles there are some times where you can say something to somebody and, you know, just talking about it with them will change their perspective on things. And there's other times where they just will not change. Um, so I could just give you an example of what I did. I can't necessarily relate to being an interracial, interracial um, relationship, but I can just give you an example of what happened to me on a job when I was a postdoc. So I was just minding my own business, doing my lab work, and I had somebody in the lab come up to me and was like, um, so it seems like you just got hired all because you just know the PI, the lab head, not because I was qualified, only because I knew her, because <laughs> I worked with her before. Um, so I waited for the opportunity where we had a lab meeting and I turned to the lab head because I wasn't the only person experiencing things like that where somebody was questioning my identity and what I was worth. I turned to the lab head and I said, can you explain to everybody here why you hired me? So they will understand that I'm qualified for this job. That's a, that's a situation where to me, it was worth fighting that battle. There are some times where it's just not worth arguing with somebody, trying to dispel some ideology or some stereotype that they have. Um, but there's other times where you can just talk to somebody and and they will change their perspective. So you have to really just think about, is this worth my time to really try to explain it or not? Sometimes it's just not it. Thank you. Okay, I know I said we were finished, but there's one last question that we have to ask. How does a white, late 50s white woman in DC best support the teens, black girls I work with? She tutors them um, and she wants to know how can she best support them in their STEM aspirations. Can I take this first? Because I would like to kind of do a segue that I'm gonna throw at my panelists. And <laughs> I'm going to say bring in inspirational black mentors and in saying that my panel is please put your handles or email addresses whatever contact information you want the audience members to have into the chat box and why do i say this because they support me they motivate me to do a program such as sim and wild black dr stevenson and i have couch conversations between kids and seminars where we draw on some of them some of us are triple as if then ambassadors so we are constantly mentoring and all of us are doing something whether it's you know in a different organization that i'm not affiliated in something that you've already initiated on your own i told you miss janae white has girls to divas mentoring organization we're all doing something to promote advocate mentor provide career exploration and so on when it comes to stem so essentially um miss ta galligan we're making your job easy. So ask us for some help. Ask us to volunteer, to render our services. You, all, you see that our mindset is already there to provide visibility, representation, mentorship, guidance, and whatever else. Use us. Don't use us in a bad way, though. I'm just saying use us for the progression of the Black woman. I, I'd like to add to that by saying that you should be intentional about opportunities you expose them to. So if you see any opportunities, bring, think of them um, and then ask them if it's something they might be interested in um, and if it's something that you can help them attain, um, whether it be applying to it or, or maybe if possible, being there for them, like driving them there or something like that. If you can do that, for sure. But think about them when random opportunities come your way because you never know how a random thing might lead to the next Nobel laureate. You, you just never know. So any opportunity that comes your way, anything you see, ask them if they might be interested. And then if you can help them uh, get to it. I would also add just to, um, to ask them to really talk about like, what are some of the dreams they have? You know, what, what are some things? Because I think, you know, many times when you're mentoring girls and you're really trying to maybe get them to become interested or to fuel their curiosity for STEM, I think a lot of times, you know, what they really dream about gets lost. 
and how to really have them to be able to maybe even merge some of their interests and hobbies with the STEM career. So not only on focusing on just STEM, but what are some other things that maybe other women are doing, other people are doing where <clears throat> they've been able to merge their interests and hobbies with a STEM career? Like Jay said, I mean, she does comics and she draws very well. I know Joyana does as well. So what are some other things you can incorporate? Um, so being able to show them all of that so that when they choose their career, um, they can enjoy it as much as possible. Um, because I think we don't want to just talk to girls and um, about STEM, but what are the opportunities within STEM that they can do, that they can wake up every day and love what they're doing? And, and that's what you really want them to do. Not only just go into STEM just to have a job, but what aspect of it is that something that they really love and can just continue to do it? I just want to add one quick thing. Um, I'm a native of Washington, D.C., so I'll say that community is everything. So if you can find ways to draw on community, the people that exist around these young ladies every day and find ways to engage them, because a lot of times we have this idea that we think we know what they need um, and pulling on the people that are around them, um, engaging their families, if you can, um, would be really good because oftentimes they have younger siblings and other siblings that also need that encouragement. And, and, and that motivation and the other things that you're bringing. So if at all possible, if you can engage their community, if you can draw on the needs of the rest of their family, um, and then everything else that everybody else added about making sure that the faces that look like them are who they are exposed to, I think those things would be great. Awesome, awesome. Thank you all for that feedback. Listen. Can I add? Yes. One last piece. Um, so I think what everybody is saying is excellent. Um, but what I would like to add to that is that you don't have to completely ignore who you are as a person to reach out to somebody of a different hue. And what do I mean? And what I mean by that is you're an older white woman and you have experienced so much of a certain aspect of life that they will never get a chance to experience. So who's better to give them advice and ways to maneuver through that world than you? Because I couldn't, as a black woman, I could not give them some of the advice that you would be able to give them. So I think it's a good idea for you to also realize that, no, you may not be their age. No, you may not be their hue, but you have something to offer to them that nobody on this panel would be able to offer them. So you don't have to lose yourself to motivate them. You don't have to lose yourself to reach to them. You do have to understand that you guys have two different experiences in life. You guys have two different sets of opportunities and you have something to offer to them that like i said nobody on this panel will be able to offer and not even just because of our skin color also because of our age i mean you're 50 you experienced a world that we never got to experience you are un you can probably understand the transition from um things that happened 50 years ago <laughs> that we will never be able to understand. So use your life's experiences to speak to their life experiences and they'll appreciate you more for that because what I, what I know for a fact about black kids is that they will love the genuine you. But the moment you try to become somebody that you're not, even if it's in the effort to reach out to them, they'll, they will see that fakeness and they will snuff it out. So just be who you are, give them what you know as a white woman, but then also do your research like you're doing right now and, and allow somebody of a different hue to come in and give them their experiences. The worst thing that you can try to do is give a black kid experiences of another black woman because they're gonna know you never experienced that and all you're doing is regurgitating information that somebody else told you to say. Give them your experiences, give them your advice, and then bring somebody else in to give them advice that matches their skin color, their experiences, and their life. Thank you, Ms. Huggins. That was necessary. We needed to hear that. Thank you. Y'all, 
this has been amazing. We've cried, we've laughed, we've shared, we've grown, and it's been such an honor to just be amongst all of you amazing women in STEM, Black women in STEM. Uh, thank y'all for y'all support. Thank you guests for being so engaging in this conversation. Uh, we are looking forward to doing this again. Again, thank you for having me. And Dr. Jones, I'm going to pass the mic to you. Yes, and thank you, Miss Janae, for your amazing hosting. As you can see, we have changed the program a little bit to have an organic conversation about this because this is something big. You can't structure it and take from, you can accidentally structure it too much and take from the conversation piece. So Ms. Janae, you did an amazing job in making sure that our amazing panelists were able to be bold, to be transparent, to share their experiences, and to talk about things beyond what a structure would have allowed them to do. So I definitely appreciate this program. I hope that our audience has received something from it. Because um, like somebody said earlier, if you're not filled, you cannot give. And I'm pretty sure that all my panelists were filled. My host was filled because they gave it all and left it here today. And I appreciate it all. So now I just leave us with that last question that I've been asking for the past few days. Where are the Black women in STEM? And I'm hoping that having events like this and having conversations like this and utilizing all the tips and experiences that we share today, that question will no longer be asked later on. Just as a reminder, tomorrow we are having our Black Men in STEM edition of STEMing While Black at 2 p.m. The link has been sent out. <laughs> uh, Dr. Stevenson has a note for you all. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say, say stay safe. Thank you for coming. Um, please, if you have us on your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and if you are following us on our new website, if you thank you. If you are not, please follow us up there. I do not want you to miss all the great announcements and the things to come. Semi Wild Black is forever evolving. There's so many great things to come. And as we have conversations here, and that's why I step back as panelists, I'm jotting down three new additions for this episode based on the conversation today. I want to talk about being a black woman in STEM and motherhood, where you're talking about careers versus motherhood. Those exchanges, those conversations we're having. And I don't think you can have it on a better platform than Stemming While Black. So please follow us and continue to grow with us. We're going to keep growing. We're going to, we're going to keep going. I will continue to work to make sure the needs are met. And my panelists are so amazing. And